The world of football is littered with fantastic stories. Teams and individuals defying all the odds, the rise of minnows, the fall of giants, and tales which speak to the most fundamental facets of the human experience, whether that be joy, despair, anger, fear or kindness. It is what keeps me in the job, and the 2022 World Cup qualifiers have been fraught with all of these tales. From North Macedonia qualifying for the playoffs to Ecuador's heroics, which has seen them climb to third in combo bowl qualifying, ahead of the likes of Chile, Uruguay and Peru, it has been a qualifying campaign to remember. Not to mention the fact that one of the Netherlands or the reigning European champions Italy are now guaranteed to be absent at this winter's finals in just 10 months time. The greatest upset, and the greatest tale of all though, I would suggest, not just in 2022 World Cup qualifying, but arguably in all of world football right now, can be found in North America, in a country which hasn't often been thought about in terms of its footballing prowess. The Canadian men's national team hasn't always provided the Canadian public with a great deal to shout about. The Canucks, as they are affectionately known, have only once qualified for the FIFA World Cup, 36 years ago, where they lost all three group games. For more than 20 years, Canada haven't just failed to qualify for the World Cup, they have failed to even reach the final qualifying group stage, the stage at which a team is actually able to qualify for the finals, or at least the Inter-Confederation playoffs. In 2014 World Cup qualifying, Canada's qualification campaign was ended by a humiliating 8-1 defeat to Honduras, a nation of fewer than 10 million people. And when the 2014 World Cup came to an end, whilst their neighbours, the United States, ranked 15th in the FIFA World Rankings, having successfully navigated the tournament's famed group of death, Canada ranked 122nd, a new low for the national team, below the likes of Rwanda, Luxembourg and Kuwait. Eight years on, Canada are a national team that have been transformed from top to bottom. A young, dynamic squad guided by an English coach who honed his skills in the women's game are playing some exhilarating football and blitzing past everyone who stands in their path. Having reached CONCACAF's final World Cup qualifying round for the first time since the 1990s, Canada currently top the third round table, unbeaten in 11 games, having beaten both Mexico and the United States, the latter their first qualifying victory against the USMNT in 41 years, and they now need just one point from their next three games against Costa Rica, Jamaica and Panama to qualify for the World Cup Finals for the first time since 1986. It is a staggering story, and one which has happened in a country without any ingrained footballing heritage or tradition. Naturally then, it requires some inspection, and for the last few weeks, that is exactly what I have been doing, following a pretty hefty number of requests, might I add. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to a land of snowy mountains, moose, and maple syrup, but for a story that is all about football, and the emergence of a national team that has risen faster than almost any other in the history of the sport, and appears determined to make this the new normal. Just as is the case in the United States, association football, or soccer, actually arrived in Canada very early on. And that should come as little surprise, given that Canada was part of the British Empire when football exploded in Britain and was home to a great many British immigrants. As such, Canada was actually home to the first football association outside of the British Isles, the Dominion Football Association, which was founded in 1877. Canada and the United States also competed in the first international football fixture to take place outside of the British Isles in 1885 as Canada emerged victorious on American soil. Given the influence of both British and French culture in Canada, two football-mad parts of the world and World Cup winners in the form of England and France, you might have thought that football would have taken root as the most popular sport in the land. Indeed, football, or soccer, did enjoy plenty of early support, but as is the case with many predominantly Anglophone nations outside of the United Kingdom, association football was soon usurped in popularity by another code of football. In Ireland, it was Gaelic football. In Australia, it was Aussie rules football. In the United States, it was obviously American football. And in Canada, it was the distinctly similar Canadian football. All had their origins in Britain's rugby football, and all would manage to establish themselves 
as their country's most popular sports. In Canada, Canadian football wasn't alone though. Ice hockey, or simply hockey as it is better known in Canada, soon enjoyed even greater support, cementing its status as the nation's favourite pastime in the late 1800s. Canadian soccer hasn't been without its moments. At the beginning of the 1960s, businessman and future Maple Leaf sports and entertainment owner Steve Stavro invested a fortune in the sport, bringing the likes of Danny Blanchflower, Johnny Haynes, and most famously of all Stanley Matthews over to Toronto roughly a decade before the United States followed a similar blueprint of bringing overseas stars into the North American game to try and increase the sport's popularity on a much larger scale with the North American Soccer League. Canada was part of the NASL experiment, which brought further big-name arrivals like Eusebio, Roberto Bottega, and Jimmy Nichol to Canada. But the league was eventually declared bankrupt, and both the US and Canada appeared to have little to show for their investment. Whilst the United States didn't experience any significant uptick in their soccer fortunes until the 1990s, Canada continued to fall deeper into the mire. The Canadian Soccer League, which was Canada's only professional soccer league, consisting of 11 teams at its peak, folded in 1992, under mounting financial pressure and the defection of the league's top teams to the United States, leaving Canadian soccer without a single professional soccer league of its own, a situation which remained the case all the way up until 2019. There was a brief reprieve for Canadian soccer fans in the year 2000 when Canada won the CONCACAF Gold Cup for only the second time, but unlike when they won it for the first time in 1985, that success would not be followed by a World Cup appearance, or even any improvement in Canada's attempts to qualify for the tournament. When the world's most popular sport finally did start to blossom in Canada, it would not come by virtue of the men's game, but the women's. Founded during the same year that Canada's men's team appeared in their only World Cup, in 1986, it took less than a decade for Canada's women's team to qualify for their first World Cup finals in 1995. Canada's women's team failed to win a game at either the 1995 or 1999 World Cups, but they won three games in the USA in 2003, earning themselves a fourth place finish. The popularity and relative success of Canada's women's team saw an explosion particularly in terms of youth participation in the sport during the 1980s and 90s, and soccer is now the most popular participation sport in Canada among both children and adults alike, with roughly twice as many registered soccer players as hockey players. If you were to attempt to trace Canada's recent explosion on the men's world stage, that is where you would have to begin but it is still remarkable quite how quick the nation's turnaround over the last couple of years has been. As I said, Canada did not have a professional soccer league between 1992 and 2019, but Toronto FC began playing Major League Soccer in 2007, followed by Vancouver Whitecaps in 2011, and Montreal Impact, or CF Montreal as they are now, in 2012. Three professional teams competing in what would probably be considered a mid-ranking league by European standards might seem woefully inadequate for a country the size of Canada. But Canada's three largest cities having professional soccer teams and MLS status was huge for Canadian soccer, prompting the creation of the Canadian Premier League in 2019, an eight-team professional top flight based solely in Canada, along with a string of relatively successful semi-professional leagues. Not only have these teams and leagues provided Canada with a much larger footballing footprint, they have also vastly improved the standard of coaching available to young players in Canada. There was a time when any talented teenage footballer in Canada would be well advised to leave the country as soon as possible, embed themselves within a European academy, and never look back. That is exactly what happened in the case of Alberta-born Owen Hargreaves, who left Calgary Foothills at the age of 16 to join Bayern Munich and ended up representing England instead of Canada. Almost two decades later, by the time that Alfonso Davies felt it necessary to turn his back on club football in Canada, also in a move to Bayern Munich per chance, he was already a full Canadian international. Davies, a Ghanaian-born refugee of Liberian descent, didn't feel the need to flee Canada as quickly as Hargreaves because his skills were being well honed in the Vancouver Whitecaps Academy, 
and the MLS provides an excellent springboard for gifted young players such as himself. Not only are Canada able to hold on to more of their players now, partly because of their vastly improved academy setup and professionalism, and partly because they have a project that excites even the most talented of teenagers, they are also able to attract those with dual nationality who previously may have looked elsewhere. One of the beauties of this rampaging Canadian team is its extraordinary diversity, representing modern Canada in a way few previous teams have. The current Canada squad contains players of Scottish, Uruguayan, Serbian, Jamaican, Liberian, and Colombian descent. Whilst that has become a blessing, it once seemed like a curse. When John Herdman took charge of the national team in 2018, it was a squad divided. Canada is a country, we ought not forget, which doesn't even share a single language. More than one in five Canadians speak French as their mother tongue, whilst 56% point to English as their first language. Within the Canada squad, several cliques had emerged, and Herdman has since spoken of full-blown fistfights breaking out between players on the training ground at the beginning of his reign. You would not think that to look at them now. Almost every Canadian player appears to be playing with a smile on their face. And why wouldn't they? Canada have lost just two of their last 22 games, winning 16 of them, with World Cup qualification having been transformed from a pipe dream to an inevitability almost within the blink of an eye. How has Herdman achieved all of this? Well, part of it has been the emergence of several young stars. Canada's national team is among the youngest in the world, and the likes of Alfonso Davies, Liam Miller, and Jonathan David have all burst onto the scene in only the last few years. We will return to their talents, and others, but it would be false to presume that their emergence, whilst pivotal to Canada's rise, has been the only contributing factor, and to overlook Herdman's own impact. Herdman is a Geordie, who was born in County Durham and grew up supporting Newcastle United. He might have felt a little conflicted then, around the turn of the millennium, when he took his first job in coaching in the Sunderland Academy whilst completing his degree and working as a part-time lecturer at Northumbria University. Herdman never played football at any serious level, hence why he was able to start coaching in his early 20s. But he soon came to the realisation that opportunities within first-team management for someone with no professional experience playing the game would be few and far between in England. Herdman watched on as gifted coaches within the Sunderland Academy were overlooked as he saw it for promotions on account of their playing careers, or lack thereof, and decided that he would have to take an alternative route. So in 2001, he left Sunderland and relocated to New Zealand, around 11,500 miles away. And in 2006, he was appointed as the head coach of New Zealand's women's national team. During his time in New Zealand, Herdman operated without any great public pressure, since women's soccer is not top of most Kiwi sporting agendas, giving him a certain amount of license to experiment and develop his own ideas as a coach. Standing at just 5 feet and 5 inches tall, Herdman openly jokes about suffering from small man syndrome and frequently refers to himself as this little hobbit from New Zealand when discussing the challenge of managing Canada's women's national team, a job that he accepted in 2011, aged 35. Canada and New Zealand might seem like equals, at least until recently, within the men's game, but in the women's game, it is a whole different kettle of fish. Herdman's work in New Zealand might have gone relatively unnoticed, but the women's game is popular in Canada, and that comes with a fair amount of pressure. Lose a few games, and you could well find yourself out of the job. The Englishman, who may be the only international football manager to have done his own TED Talk, inherited a Canadian national team that had just finished 16th out of 16 teams at the 2011 Women's World Cup, and were at rock bottom. Four years later, at a World Cup finals played on home soil, they reached the quarterfinals, and at both the 2012 and 2016 Summer Olympic Games, Herdman's side took bronze. It was a minor scandal and the source of no lack of controversy, therefore, in 2018, when news broke that Herdman will be leaving the women's team to take over the men's team, just a year before the 2019 Women's World Cup. Canada's women's team went out in the round of 16 in France, but they won Olympic gold in Tokyo in 2021. 
Herdman said he left the women's team because, despite their impressive results, his funding had never increased across his seven years in the job, and that he felt he could take the team no further without increased investment. Success in the far more lucrative men's game, he argued, and particularly qualification for the finals of the Men's World Cup, would bring in far greater revenue for the Canadian Soccer Association, which could then be redistributed to develop the sport in the country, including the women's game. There is a certain amount of logic to that, though one suspects there was also a degree of personal ambition that factored into Herbman's decision, which is certainly no criticism of him. His first job would be to heal the fractures within Canada's men's team, building up their trust in one another, and ultimately in him. That was both his first job and also his greatest success. Tactically, Herdman is extremely pragmatic and inventive. Canada have been known to make radical formation changes and changes of shape from game to game, adapting seamlessly to their manager's demands, with the results paying dividends. Herdman has earned that trust from his players, both on the training ground and out on the pitch. As their success when following his advice builds and builds, so too does Herbman's esteem within the eyes of his own players. At this stage, he could probably convince Alfonso Davies to play in net and most of the squad to run through a brick wall for him. Davies is clearly Canada's star man, and already, at the age of only 21, Canada's most decorated and most gifted footballer of all time. Davies broke through at Bayern Munich under Hansi Flick as a left-back, filling in for David Alaba, who slotted in at centre-back following an injury to Nicolas Zula. In his breakout campaign, Davies won a treble at Bayern Munich, including the Champions League, and became the first Canadian player to make the FIFA Pro World eleven. Davies was never a left-back in the MLS, though, and he doesn't play as a left-back for the Canadian national team. In fact, most of the time, no one plays as a left-back for Canada, with the Englishman opting to play with two really energetic wing-backs in Sam Adekebi and Richie Larea, who eat up an awful lot of ground on both flanks. To hear Herdman talk about Davies is not like hearing most coaches talk about one of their players. He speaks about him with an admiration that a starstruck fan might have when meeting one of their heroes. And it is the same way in which he often spoke about Christine Sinclair when managing Canada's women's team, who is undoubtedly one of the finest female footballers to have ever lived. Herdman invites Davies to share with him how Bayern Munich prepare for games and what approaches he thinks works well and which don't in Bavaria. Most managers would have no interest in hearing how other managers operate and would be almost insulted if a player started making suggestions based upon what they do at club level. Herdman actively requests that information, not in a way that seems to undermine his authority, but rather acknowledges a constant willingness to improve, the same willingness that he demands from his players. When he talks about tactics, however, Herdman's tone completely changes. No longer does he appear to be an adoration of Davies, David, and others, but rather, now they have become chess pieces on a board, and Herdman is Vasily Smyslov screwing them into a position where they can inflict maximum damage upon his opponents. He describes Davies as being like a caged lion at Bayern Munich, whilst playing at left-back, and says that he plays him further forward to inspire dread in Canada's CONCACAF rivals. Davies has certainly done that, with 10 goals from 30 caps at the age of 21, but do not be fooled into thinking that Canada are a one-man team. Double up on Davies, and you are in big trouble, since in Cal Laren and Jonathan David, Canada have the two most prolific forwards in CONCACAF football right now. David, who was born in Brooklyn, New York in the year 2000, is only one year older than Davies, and won a shock league and title with Leal last season. Whilst Lille are no longer even in the top half of the league and table this season, following a mass exodus over the summer, David has been even more prolific this season, currently trailing only Viss and Ben Yedda and having outscored both Kylian Mbappe and Lionel Messi in the league and scoring charts. Herdman describes him as having ice in his veins and predicts that he will be playing for a European giant before long. For what it's worth, I do not disagree. Whilst Canada's squad is an extremely young one, with plenty of 17 and 18 year olds recently having won their first caps and proving that there are plenty more reasons for Canadian soccer fans to feel optimistic about the future, it is a blend of youth and experience that has been key to their current success. 
Atiba Hutchinson, now aged 39, had threatened several times in the past to hang up his international boots in an international career spanning 19 years that had heralded so little success. But still starring for Besiktas at club level, he doesn't look like a man who is pushing 40 at all, playing a pivotal role in a double pivot alongside Steven Yastico for Canada, who isn't far off half his age and recently signed for Porto on loan from fellow Portuguese Primeira Liga side Pacos de Ferreira. Yastico, it must be said, has been the unsung hero of Canada's rise and has been almost as important as their three famed forwards. Whereas Canada were once a team who would sit in, get men behind the ball, and look first and foremost not to concede, often seemingly playing for a draw, now they are virtually fearless. Even when stepping out in front of over 60,000 fans at the Estadio Azteca, one of world football's most imposing and intimidating venues, Canada, appeared to be undaunted. It is not that they are totally gung-ho, they still sit in deep at times, but they know when to sit tight, when to counter with purpose, and they are a team that senses blood. And when they get a whiff, they don't hesitate to go in for the kill. Every team in CONCACAF has felt that killer instinct over this qualification campaign in a part of the world that was long billed as simply being Mexico, the United States, and the rest. Canada are as yet untested against external powers outside of North America, who will present them with new and different challenges, but they are unlikely to fear them, and just the chance to face them on a level footing and as equals at a World Cup is something that was beyond most Canadians' dreams until very recently. Canada's success has inspired unprecedented domestic interest in the sport at every level of the game. People who have never previously taken any interest in soccer are suddenly asking their soccer-loving friends what is going on and have started tuning into games. Canada's World Cup qualifiers now attract a TV audience around twice the size as the Toronto Maple Leafs NHL games and rising, whilst live audiences have also reached generational highs in terms of consistent crowds. Among soccer-loving youngsters in Canada, Messi and Ronaldo shirts are being replaced with Davies and David Canada shirts. There is a sense that something special is happening. And of course, the 2026 World Cup will be played partly on home soil. Together with the United States and Mexico, Canada is jointly hosting the 2026 World Cup, which will be the first time that the Men's World Cup has come to Canada. Most Canadians were excited not only by the prospect of hosting a World Cup, but the fact that it meant Canada would automatically qualify for the tournament. Few expected them to qualify for the finals in 2022 and to have a realistic prospect of going into the tournament in 2026 as the most highly rated CONCACAF nation. Indeed, following more than three decades of hurt, some Canadians refuse to get too excited about 2022 World Cup qualification until it is a mathematical certainty, despite them only needing one point from their last three games. That may be a valid concern in CONCACAF though, which is a confederation which throws up some truly bizarre results, even by the standards of international football. For that reason, Canadians will be constantly wary and fearful of being inflicted with a humiliating defeat against one of the minnows that they appear to have outstripped over the last few years. But if they can maintain the same level of consistency, professionalism, and improvement that they have shown over the last few years, Canada could dominate CONCACAF for years to come. That is not a wholly unrealistic prospect, and what's more, it would be great news for CONCACAF. Iron sharpens iron, or so the Bible says, and I have often felt that a proper competitive rivalry between Canada and the United States, with just a bit of needle in it, would really drive both nations on, as well as forcing Mexico to kick on and find another level. Right now, Mexico look to be stagnating, whilst the USMNT, who have a golden generation all of their own, are at risk of throwing it away whilst Canada make the most of theirs. Regardless of what the teams around them do, you can start to get an idea, given the very obvious direction of travel, of just how seismic the 2026 World Cup could be for Canada, and how it could really cement soccer status, not just as a major participation sport in the country, but a sport that they are capable of competing at, at the very highest level, for years to come, in both the men and women's game. 
In some respects, Canada's rise is not dissimilar to the rise of the USMNT during the 1990s, when they also saw a rise in popularity and professionalism and managed to qualify for their first World Cup in 40 years, four years before they hosted the FIFA World Cup. Just before I finish, it would be remiss of me not to mention, especially in light of me talking so extensively about the women's game in Canada, the ongoing sexual abuse scandal relating to women's soccer in Canada. At least 14 former high-level female soccer players in Canada have accused Soccer Canada and Vancouver Whitecaps of failing to protect them from abuse and inappropriate behaviour from coaches in allegations which implicate some of the most senior figures within the Canadian game. During the same week that I'm recording this video, longtime women's soccer coach and former Canada under-20 women's team boss Bob Berada pleaded guilty to three counts of sexual assault and one count of touching a young person for a sexual purpose. In charges which spanned from 1988 to 2006 and related to four separate victims, giving some indication as to the severity and timescale of these crimes and other alleged crimes. Whilst there is much to be cheerful about relating to Canadian soccer at this moment in time, that is one dark chapter that requires full investigation and prosecution where necessary, and one commends the women who came forward following those experiences. It is one of a great many sexual abuse scandals that have come to light in recent years, many of them spanning decades, and it is high time that football, or soccer, treated sexual abuse, sexual assault, and violence against women and young boys far more seriously across the globe to prevent these instances from repeating themselves. Canada's men's national team's last three World Cup qualifiers take place at the end of March 2022, after which, without an almost unthinkable collapse, they will be looking to arrange some friendlies and test themselves against non-CONCACAF opposition ahead of the nation's second ever World Cup. Having been ranked 122nd in the FIFA World Rankings in 2014 and 73rd at the beginning of 2021, just over 12 months on in the recently updated rankings, Canada now find themselves ranked as the 33rd best men's national team on the planet, an all-time high for the Canucks. So that is it for today's video, but thank you all as ever for watching. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case, or just if you're feeling kind. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7. You can also find me personally on uh, Twitter and on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.